Welcome to all of you. Thank you for um, the organizer to, to uh, leave us this room to talk about uh, an exciting topic, which is lessons learned. I'm uh, Bruno Dupré. I'm working for the European Diplomatic Service, the EEAS at the European Union, and uh, I deal with uh, CBRN non-proliferation issues. And I'm very happy to chair this uh, session. And I will present in a, in a couple of minutes, once I have introduced the topic, the uh, speakers of today. Um, well, the European Union is spending a lot of money on CBRN issues. And to a certain extent, we've been said that we're spending too much money on CBRN issues. And indeed, um, for the period between 20, 2007 and 2020, we're going to spend 300 million euros through our centers of excellence. So it is a lot of money. But it is for eight regions, and it is for 56 countries, with 15 to come. So if you divide this amount of money by the number of years, uh, and if you uh, divide it by the numbers of uh, countries, you see that uh, uh, it's not so, so much money. But then... Very frankly, in a non-proliferation disarmament uh, arena and with this kind of crowd we have today, um, the question is, um, why are we so interested in those CBRN issues after all? And um, I like to call it asthma issues, but for, for, I would say, several reasons. But the first one is, I think, as we can see, the criminal export exploitation of CBRN will increase. And if we compare Al-Qaeda to Daesh, uh, if we look at this uh, mustard thing, we know that it will only increase. Um, second, and it's even more important, I would say industrial challenge and natural catastrophes. Uh, this is coming, this is coming because more and more countries uh, uh, we'll go through uh, economic and social development, and, and they will be challenged by climate change. And you will see, uh, in terms of uh, impacting on uh, their development and also on their security, um, CBRN, be it uh, pandemics, be it uh, the uh, blowing up of a, um, a specific uh, plant, or be it for criminal exploitation, will be one of the main threats, or will remain, but it will be one of the main threats of the 21st century. And, and my guess is that uh, the criminal part will be only uh, uh, one of uh, the uh, uh, many issues, and I see more climate change being uh, something we have to look at it <coughs> as, a, as a future threat or the future risk that uh, the planet is uh, going through CBRN so to discuss this, we took with my speaker three topics with uh, sexy uh, titles. Huh? I'm, I'm sure uh, the, the room will be full in a couple of minutes because compared to the others, uh, who, 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 who doesn't want to talk about Syria, Ebola, hello. Uh, and uh, what else I took, uh, Syria, Ebola, and uh, uh, yes, uh, Fukushima. Fukushima. Man, uh, man, that could match any... any uh, uh, Oh, how do you call it? James Bond movie. Um, all right, but seriously, now I'm going to introduce uh, the, our, my speakers and our speakers. Uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Suzuki, uh, who is a director, professor of research center for nuclear weapons abolition, Nagasaki University, also, also called RECNA. Before joining RECNA, um, Mr. Suzuki was a vice chairman of Japan Atomic Energy Commission, so-called JAEC, from January 2010 to March 2014. He's also a council member of Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs, 
2007-2009, and from 2014 uh, ongoing. Dr. Suzuki has a PhD in nuclear engineering from Tokyo University. On my, and welcome to you, sir. You. Uh, on my left, Dr. Maurizio Barbeski, team leader. Um, Mr. Barbeski, WHO scientist, is a team leader of the Health and Security Interface. This team provides strategic advices on preparedness for and response to high visibility, high consequences events like bioterrorism, mass gathering, so on, to the WHO director of the Department of Global Alert and Response, so-called GAR. Dr. Barbeski's role is to provide strategic coordination on safety and security implications of the so-called GAR department's activity, the Global Alert and Response Department. And um, on my um, and left, Professor Martin Scott Tabby, um, who is national focal point for the EU CBRN Centers of Excellence from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Liberia. And Mr. Scott Tabby is currently senior desk officer in charge of the Bureau of European Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Liberia. In addition to this role, he is also graduate assistant for diplomacy and negotiation at the University of Liberia and co-opted national focal point of Liberia for the UN EU chemical, bio, radiological and nuclear initiative of the Centers of Excellence for the part um, that is located in the uh, African Atlantic facade with the uh, Secretariat located in Rabat. So to make that lively, I have only given to my speakers between five and eight minutes max, and I will interrupt them by all means, uh, but force because I'm uh, physically not capable to, but uh, I will uh, require the assistance of the, uh, of the floor itself if needed to respond to those questions in the order they want. And the idea is that you get the floor as uh, soon as possible so we can exchange on what happened and, and what could happen again. First question, people wonder why experts on pandemics, on tsunami, or on chemicals seem always taken by surprise. Do not we have relevant early warning systems? First question. Second question was, what were the challenges met on site uh, compared to headquarters, if I may say? And the third question is, what useful new lessons, new lessons, because we already had crisis on Ebola, nuclear staff, and uh, chlorine uh, uh, or WMD uh, chemical-related issues. So what we, useful le new lessons we learned this time from the three crises. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Suzuki, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much for introduction. So I have seven minutes, five to seven minutes. Um, I was at the uh, uh, government, within the government, the accident happened. So this is my remarks on uh, both my personal experiences and also uh, based on the uh, study uh, by the accident uh, investigation committees. Okay, the first question, why experts seem always taken by surprise? In the Fukushima case, there were, there were several earning warning systems, early warnings, actually. Three sources. One is scientific technical studies done by both inside TEPCO and outside the government. And they all uh, are aware of the studies, but they did not take the, those seriously. One particular example is actually tsunami studies yeah. done by TEPCO engineer and scientist, but it was reported to uh, TEPCO senior officials, but ignored basically. So uh, that's one thing. The second is interesting is local knowledge. Uh, there was same degree of similar degree of tsunami came to uh, Onagawa nuclear power station and also Tokai uh, nuclear power station. They were prepared based on local knowledge transfer from the previous generation, but Fukushima didn't have any such local knowledge because Fukushima nuclear power plants were built by TEPCO, which was outside of the community, actually. They built a nuclear power plant outside their own territory. 
So local knowledge is very imp important. The third one is, of course, learning from others. There were similar flooding uh, experiences to uh, power loss accident in France in 1999. And they were also, of course, aware, but they just ignore all their things. So, so my uh, short answer is there were early warning uh, uh, reports and studies and knowledge, and how you're going to take those things is the question. Second is what are the challenges met on site? There are three things I'd like to say. One is, of course, the preparation, lack of preparation for TEPCO. Uh, in Fukushima case, basically, loss of water and loss of power, the key issues. Water, they see there are sea water across the, uh, near the plant, so you can pump out from the uh, sea water is the best way to do it, but there is no power to pump up. So they call up the fire engines to help the, uh, to pour in the water. The problem was um, the staff of the TEPCO did not know how to drive a fire engine because they all subcontracted to uh, other companies, people, to manage to drive the fire engine and how to use it. So the staff on site didn't know how to use it. So it took many, many hours to, to, uh, to use the fire engines. And also, the batteries, for instance. There were batteries on site in the uh, car parking spot. There are all, more than probably 30 or 40 cars waiting, I mean, sitting in the, on, on site. And they did not take out the batteries in time. They did not think about it to use it uh, on site. And even they tried to buy the batteries off site, but they didn't have money, cash. They didn't have a cash. They, have, they had the money in safe in the uh, uh, office, central office, but central office was broken by a tsunami. So lack of uh, preparedness was the one big uh, issue. The second is, of course, communication problems. No real-time communication between off-site and on-site. There were communications between TEPCO headquarters and Fukushima site, but the government emergency headquarters didn't know until the second day. So uh, no real-time com communication. The communication was done by fax on paper. It's hard to read because of handwritten. So uh, lack of sufficient communication between emergency center and the, the governments. The communication is also lacking between the local governments and the central government. They also communicated by fax. That was not good enough. So the communication is the second problem. Third one is so-called coordination. The problem is that uh, there were mistrust among the stakeholders within the government and uh, between the local governments and the central government. So even if they have to communicate very closely, they do not believe what, they, what the other people say. So it was a lacking trust was a serious issue. So coordination and lack of trust is a problem. OK, so the third final question, what are the new useful uh, lessons? Um, I would say three again. One is so-called think unthinkable is a key phrase that I learned a lesson from this serious accident. There's no zero risk. So anything, anything could happen. You have to be prepared. And so uh, it is it's very difficult for engineers because engineers tend to set out the key questions first and then try to answer it. But the society, in the real society, anything could happen beyond such you know, uh, assumptions. So beyond design-based accident was a key word, and we have to be prepared for think unthinkable. The second is lack of a clear responsibility has to be designated before the crisis happens. Um, there's a no clear responsibility assigned to each site, on-site and off-site. So there are lots of confusions, and you have to be prepared for, for the emergency. This is... You know, in Japan, most activity is done by group, and it's good to have a teamwork. But in the case of crisis, teamwork sometimes doesn't work. You have to make some key decision maker to make a very quick decision, and that is not the case for Fukushima. <coughs> Finally, sharing information. This is difficult. During the crisis situation, 
it's very difficult to decide which information should be disclosed, which information should not be disclosed. There's no specific rules, so it was a very significant confusion why we did not disclose this information, why you disclose this information. So the press release and uh, uh, public relations operations were very confused. That, that's why the public was very confused. So those are the three things uh, we learned lesson from the Fukushima. Okay, thank you. That's it. That's the end. Dr. Suzuki, excellent. Um, same questions. Um, good afternoon. It's intimidating. <laughs> it's really intimidating. So, I work with WHO, but I shall not speak on behalf of WHO, nor of the UNODA, which was leading the mission in Syria. What I can do, though, to die in the next five minutes is to share some of the direct experiences that I have. So I leave more time for the question and answer, which is possibly more interesting than listening to me talking. So I was in the response in Nigeria for Ebola and in Sierra Leone all around the borders. And I was the head of the WHO component of the Syria investigation, the first one, the Sirstrom investigation. The second reason why I am intimidated, because the head of UNODA, Angela Kane, is sitting there on my left hand side. <laughs> so, <laughs> any question, please <laughs> give it to Angela. In terms of Syria, first question, early warning, chemical doesn't exist. So if you have an attack, a chemical attack, any early warning in terms of uh, physical or sniffers is basically uh, much more trouble than, uh, than the solution. What you can do, though, early is following the victim. Second lesson learned, there is very, very little difference in the way the investigation of events, both chemical or biological, from the epidemiology perspective, there is no difference, or very little difference. So if you follow the victim, you understand where the exposures are, you are basically 80% home. So the treatment and the clinical part belongs to the doctors, but the understanding of how the exposure was, that's called appunto, epidemiology. That is the same for almost the, all three of the various sources of various risks we are talking about. Uh, field problems in uh, Syria, well, is almost an oxymoron. Uh, there was something that has been discuss in the previous days, here yeah, the previous day, and there is something we should clarify. Uh, the mission in Syria was like if you are having guests for dinner and then you prepare for four people, there is somebody else saying, oh, but one is vegetarian. Ah, you start changing the thing. There is another one here, it just doesn't eat pork. The fourth one is allergic. So rather than having one mission, we end up having 17 requests of verification with different features, different agents, different places. So the same kitchen was had to adjust to address so many different requests, one of which, big one, Guta, happened once we were there on site. Scale never heard before other than Alabsha in a site we are so <coughs> crowded, and I don't want to share the story here, but the... Uh, the one of the most difficult parts is to readjust our uh, brain, our thinking, to face a black swan where the victims are still walking. So it wasn't just the pressure from the media, it was also the uh, terrible events that was there. It was really very, very, very sad. Lesson learned is basically, uh, oh, and in the field, moving for a moment into the Ebola, one thing... Uh, in the first phase of Ebola in Guinea, the response was normal, normal Ebola. Uh, we deployed 50 people. The cases were going down, like in a normal epicurve, to the point that somebody said wrongly, the epidemic is over. They are still laughing about us for that. The real issue is that they didn't, we didn't understood that the same people of the three countries, which are living in 10 kilometers, is the same tribe but they speak French in Guinea, uh, quasi-UK in one side and quasi-American on the other. So when this patient, family-wise, 
like having a balloon and squeezing it, goes, they just left, went through the borders, there are no borders, and they ended up being in the cities, three different cities, with three different health systems, three different languages. By then, the story was over. Just put it back in a bottle. Imagine to have something like this here between the French system, the Dutch system, and the Belgian system, and try to manage a crisis in Europe in that way. I don't want to get any further. For the lesson learned is uh, yes planning, yes preparedness, but without any lateral thinking, without any new way of approaching, rather than buying new stuff, let's try to use better what we have. Uh, that goes for any crisis, because what we will do or what we will face is going to change anyhow in, uh, by, by the time we reach the end of the crisis. Um, the real last, last comment on lesson learned is that each of the institutions that are responded in Syria uh, and each of the institutions that are responded in Ebola, they have a treasure of lesson learned for themselves but there is very little or rather shyness to share or pride to share those lessons learned across the various organizations. What the OPCW learned in Syria is very useful for us, vice versa, and was informing what MSF did learn and Red Cross was a huge patrimony of knowledge that these crowds are offering. And in general, we, we collectively are not that good in keeping stock or getting stock of this one. Again, the, the best part is the your question later. Thank you. <laughs> what would the other do? The other room. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I feel humbled to be here this afternoon presenting this paper on CBRN lessons learned from Fukushima, Ebola, and Syria. For the purpose of uh, this, this uh, session, I've prepared, preferred to utilize the creative and exploratory approach with the intent to stimulate discussions after the presentation. I will begin by uh, quoting Mr. Stephen Humble and Adam Anthos, who in their publication stated that the impact of nuclear, radiological, chemical, or biological. Uh, Just try to push the mic a bit back. Okay. Go. Yeah, materials relative to the uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, do not exclusively mirror the uh, destructiveness, but uh, rather <clears throat> in the anxiety and fear that they create. WMDs can range from extremely complex weapon systems where a high level of expertise is needed to a relatively unsophisticated munition where only a minimal amount of scientific knowledge is required to create and exploit them. The, useful, the usefulness of chemical, biological, and radiological uh, nuclear technology development in the 21st century can hardly be refuted, especially in the manufacturing, aeronautic, health, energy, production, defense, agriculture, and space exploration industries to name a few competing sectors of technological advancement. However, this promises of significant benefits in a variety of fields, the world may never be a safe place to live in without the stringent regulations of CBR and science and technology. Knowledge of these benefits, like any human activity that involves only hazards and no benefits, would have called for a legal regime of prohibition, not regulation. Thus, firmly legislation legislating nuclear energy and related CBR activities in its dual focus on risk and benefit is indispensable. Lessons learned from the topic under discussions.
Although, although nuclear energy possesses special economic benefits to humans compared to other forms of energy productions like petrol, coal, and oil, it has demonstrated significant risk to the health and safety of persons and to the environment, risk if not carefully managed when faced with an unexpected event could translate to a tragedy. Two good examples are the Chernobyl and Fukushima, both classified as level seven events, the maximum classification on the international nuclear event scale. The Chernobyl incident was a catastrophic nuclear accident that occurred on April 26 in 1986 at the uh, Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine, resulting from different wrong decisions during uh, the management of the nuclear plant, caused a big nuclear explosion of fire, releasing large quantities of radioactive particles into the atmosphere where which spread over which, uh, much of the Western USSR and Europe. It became the worst nuclear power plant accident in history in terms of cost and casualties. Likewise, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, which occurred after the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, the second worst nuclear incident in history, uh, displaced 50,000 households after radioactive materials leaked into the air, soil, and sea again. The staff handling of operation was highly questionable. The difficulty in management of nuclear waste uh, it takes many years to eliminate its radioactivity and risk. <clears throat> Due to these complexities, most countries are unwilling to accommodate or manage toxic-related waste, creating an avenue for illegal trafficking and dumping of biochemicals and nuclear hazardous waste in African countries along the African Atlantic facade. Uh, the 2006 Ivory Coast toxic waste dump that provoked a biohealth crisis in Cote d'Ivoire is a good example. <clears throat> the fear by the international uh, community of state, uh, of state actors not effectively safeguarding their uh, chemical, biological, and radiological uh, arsenal, thereby giving way to non-state actors uh, like uh, uh, ISIS, Boko Haram, and others to acquire uh, these capabilities and even able to develop uh, weapons of mass destruction cannot be an exaggeration. In 2014, as the largest and longest Ebola outbreak in history engulfed the West African nation, including Liberia, Sierra Leone, and the Republic of Guinea, the world learned a great deal of lessons, which have today shaped a more strategic approach frontward, not only applicable to biological incidents such as Ebola virus disease, but also to chemical, radiological, and nuclear disasters. They are the emergency preparedness, staffing, and communication. Ebola outbreak, the Syrian chemical attack, the Chernobyl and Fukushima incidents highlighted how complicated emergency response can be especially when at a multiple or large scale occurring simultaneously. Worse even, when there is little preparedness at the national level. Emergency staff protection. Because the scientific, uh, because, of, because the, spe the specific sequence of incident is unknown, 
Emergency respondents must be adequately protected and strategies must be robust and provide multiple methods to establish and maintain critical safety functions using a defense in-depth approach. National first responders, the setting up, training, and periodic drills first of first responders is vital and must be sufficiently challenging and realistic to prepare operating crews and emerging response persons to cope with multiple complex response to uh, situations that may accompany natural disaster. State must address the imminent emergency response needs for human resource, equipment, and facilities in the first few hours of an event, as well as the need for a long-duration response capable in, uh, capable in uh, addition. The state should uh, strategize how to engage the domestic and international bodies obtain needed support and assistance during the event. Optimum incident management strategies and associated implementing procedures, such as emergency operating <coughs> procedures and incident management guidelines, should be developed through communication, engagement, and exchange of information among stakeholders at national and international levels, including vendors. Contact tracing and information dissemination enable a more adequate mapping, indication, uh, identification, information sharing, and indeed, and needed assistance to uh, affected areas and individuals. Trauma healing and counseling. This psychotherapy proved very effective to families who lost their dear ones uh, during the disaster and effective um, and the closing of frontiers also proved very anti-productive. Uh, it was discovered that it was not a wise decision because it did not only exacerbate the Ebola situation, it caused the illegal immigration of Ebola-affected persons from one country to the other along the borders. Uh, the post-incident economic uh, recovery plan, this aspect is relatively important, taking into consideration the inactiveness of domestic economy during the span of a disaster or outbreak. A good example is the post-Ebola recovery plan of President Elin Johnson Sirleaf of the Republic of Liberia. On this note, I thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor. What I would like to do now is um, to give the floor to the floor, uh, and not only to ask questions, but first, I, I know many people here who, who have been involved one way or the other, either academically or operationally, with one of those crises or uh, one of those thematic, and I'd like to hear from them what are, according to them, lessons learned. I can ask Pascal, Mark, Maurizio, Sibyl, uh, Michel, uh, for those I know. So try to, to tell me what is it you, you think your community learned from, uh, from those crises uh, and um, short mm -hmm. and to the point. Maurizio. Very short. Congratulations <laughs> for this excellent piece. Uh, Yes, Maurizio Martellini, I'm following the rule of uh, Mark. Uh, you remember me confused to identify myself. Maurizio Martellini from uh, the network, uh, the super center. So um, I have uh, three uh, questions and remarks on lesson learned, uh, as you ask. Uh, Professor Suzu, it's clear for me that uh, what is lacking uh, is uh, 
cultural attitude. And, uh, and this is a typical problem in any emergency situation, like, uh, you know, the deep horizon. Uh, so the problem of the communication from the ground in which you have the accident to the decision maker. So there exists definitely a cultural hiato, a cultural problem, and, uh, and this it should be an indication for the commission and external service that uh, beside the CBRN project, it should be very important uh, to try to unify the language uh, to create what is called uh, now, I don't like the language, but it's called uh, now CBRN security culture. But uh, for Maurizio Barbeschi, uh, of course, I always thought uh, that running back to, uh, I am a physics, so I have a scientific attitude, uh, running back to Black Swan, uh, Black Swan or 9-11 event uh, is interesting for journalists, but uh, for many, many things it's not possible to have uh, a magic uh, risk assessment formula. Uh, the complexity uh, is too rich, uh, too many variables you, you cannot create. So for Maurizio, it should be very, mm, it should be important even if uh, due to the pressure of uh, financing to have a transversal, uh, transversal dialogue among uh, the main pillar of, uh, the, 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 of the treaties, the underlying here there are three treaties, but to have also a dialogue between WHO, BWC, and the and Chemical Weapon Convention, because definitely um, they have different, let's say, semantics, eh? lesson learned, different semantics, but there is no real transversal uh, communication except uh, in the crisis. The excellent presentation of uh, Professor Scott. Um, and, uh, always, uh, this there is a problem of a national action plan. Now, CBRN, uh, center, uh, CBRN Risk Mitigation Center of Excellence, have as a goal to produce a CBRN nation, national action plan. Okay, wonderful, but as a professor, I say that perhaps are not very useful because uh, epidemics have uh, no border, uh, have uh, no border. I mean, uh, if you have something uh, happen in Liberia, then Congo, even in Guinea or others. So, and if uh, the neighboring country are not, have uh, not uh, uh, unified, uh, let's say, system of response and mitigation, uh, the problem, you don't solve the problem. Uh, I mean, uh, and uh, this is the criticism to my friend uh, Dupre. I mean, uh, the, the thinking in terms of Bra Brazil, or thinking in terms of the Washington Consensus is very good from some part of the world, but perhaps it should be very important to create uh, a common language. So rather than to speak a national action plan, it should be perhaps more important to create a regional action plan and to oblige, the, uh, to constrict or to invite the regional secretariat head to have a communication. These are my comments and uh, suggestions. Thank you. Understood. Thank you for the presentations. Um, I was uh, going to uh, respond to something Professor Suzuki uh, said uh, also, but uh, I was prompted a bit more even by Mauricio's uh, comments uh, about uh, black swans and its uh, consequences. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say that uh, neither 9-11 nor um, Fukushima were black swan events. They were foreseeable in quite uh, easy ways, both of them, and there were many indicators. However, uh, for black swan events, uh, the thing is, it's uh, foreseeing the unforeseeable is not something to be said like that. There are a number of methodologies to address them. However, it means that uh, on the part of um, the organization, the investment must be made to do that type of uh, analysis on a constant uh, basis. 
it is not enough to come up with a statistical probability of an event once in 300 or 400 years because that doesn't include that it actually happens in the second year of the 400 period uh, and so on. So uh, basically what I uh, wa want to say in uh, response is uh, for a variety of those uh, events, it is uh, detailed trend analysis, various aspects that need to be uh, analyzed on a constant basis and then uh, correlating the independent trends with each other to see what things that you would not normally expect might actually uh, produce uh, happen at a certain point. Thank you. Mark? Following the Mark Fitzpatrick, IISS, the following the chairman's uh, request, I drew the conclusion that Murphy's Law applies in these cases. Things that could go wrong went wrong. Not always the things we thought might go wrong. In the case of Ebola, I think uh, it actually, things that went wrong were that <laughs> resources were deployed that ultimately weren't needed. But actually, that's also my question. Do you think that's correct? Do you think Murphy's Law applies? Uh, probably applies most in the Fukushima case. And then to link this session with some of the other sessions we have been talking about, Murphy's Law, if there's a reason for disarmament, it has to be Murphy's Law. Come on, uh, Professor Suzuki. Uh, first of all, Murphy's Law, in the case of the Tokyo subway uh, attack, but Sarindo has the same uh, issue of communications and also not preparedness, although there was an alert. But uh, according to the uh, information from interrogation of uh, Khaled Sheikh Mohammed, the operative which uh, planned the 9-11 attacks, uh, he also planned an attack on a nuclear station and uh, Osama bin Laden did not accept. Uh, and my question is, uh, do you think that the international community is prepared for such a scenario? Uh, many experts, and I'm among them, I think this is the, uh, the most plausible scenario of a nuclear attack rather than uh, uh, stealing a, a, a bomb or producing a bomb. This is pr practically impossible. And uh, uh, the question is indeed if there is an international uh, awareness of this. I know that, for instance, in France there are preparations, perhaps in the United States, but the other car countries. Uh, and to Maurizio, uh, what lessons you have from the fact that the inspections were in a battlefront uh, situation and uh, uh, the constraints, I would say, uh, political, military, operative, and what about the biological uh, Syrian uh, uh, arsenal? Uh, was it treated, is somebody uh, thinking to treat also this issue of the biological uh, threat? Thank you. Okay, uh, we stop here and we wait for short um, answers from, from uh, our side and be prepared for a second wave of questions for those who uh, have not quoted the name yet, but I'm, uh, I'll be on it soon. Who wants to start to, um, to answer the uh, different uh, either statement or questions. Um, Maurizio. Uh, if you want to wake up an audience in the afternoon, you just mention Black Swan. So that was did it on purpose. So I know that uh, Black Swan is meaningful only if you say to who is a Black Swan. Berlin Wall in Nepal wasn't that much of a swan. So I did that on purpose, leaving half, and apparently it was... Uh, the planning for and the preparation uh, to answer your question, the we are talking CBRN doesn't exist anymore. It's a terminology that was 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Now, even the thinking in the government evolved from 2001 to 2009 when the White House had a white paper towards let's see where the victim, where the victim goes and let's try to prevent the... Uh, the consequent the exposures of these events altogether. The international health regulations are trading all hazards. There is no difference on where the, which kind of exposure, which kind of sources. We will, we, not just WHO, but the international community is preparing more and more and more to address the consequences of what was going to happen when something happened to the Murphy's Law of Mark, which I do like. 
Uh, Bioweapons in Syria, I have no clue, of course. The, um, on the other hand, acting on the front line in a conflict, in the second time we went to Syria to investigate the allegations of the Syrian counterpart, whether Sarin was used to their soldiers, one of which was proven, by the way, is in the report. Uh, the area was in a no man's zone, it was bulldozed because the impact point, which was interesting for the inspectors, was bulldozed to make a wall against the snipers. So sometimes the investigations, no, often the investigations are sub-ideal. Uh, before, the day before Aguta, I was on a convoy planned to go to Aleppo to finally investigate the first Canal Asal event. Now, the way you investigate an event six months later is, of course, different <laughs> than one happened three days before. So the field condition, the, also the memory of the victims, the memory of the first responder, the footprint in the society, of, uh, it does change uh, in, the, in, the, in the front side. So the same level, degree of confidence of the proof, of the burden of proof that you have on site in a war is different that you want to uh, bring. Same goes for intelligence. Everybody brings you evidence, but to go in a UN investigation, you have to ensure a chain of custody that could, and, and, and a science that can withstand the scrutiny at the Security Council level, which is political in nature. Uh, last comment that I had on, he was on, uh, um, I forgot. The biological weapons on Syria. I am not aware of any offensive program, and it's beyond my uh, capacity to comment on, on that, of course. It's not uh, far above my payroll, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Well, um, I, uh, I believe uh, the Morphis Law could be applied to the Ebola case because there was indeed an early warning. Um, the incident, the alarm of Ebola, Zaire, was uh, given by uh, MSF, France, and it was not given the attention that it needed by state actors. Uh, perhaps, maybe, uh, because of the communication channel. Um, again, again, it took a good while of over a month plus when WHO signal sent a signal that um, this was under control. Knowing well that WHO does not know the terrain, neither did they know the cultural behavior of the dwellers within this three triangle, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, uh, the parties concerned, the state, these three states, did not pay the attention that was necessary. Consequently, sleeping over a period of time until June, when the second outbreak actually overwhelmed the international community. Um, so I believe um, there was enough knowledge, there was enough time, so it could be applied. Again, in Syria, there was a, a, it's, it's an open secret that the Syrian government possessed uh, weapons, chemical agents and weapons, and um, also it was known that the state is a fragile state and uh, very little attention was paid to whether the arsenals were properly safeguarded or not. Knowing that a state at that uh, stage is only trying to survive uh, and is fragile, cannot keep control what it possesses. Uh, Non-state actors it was foreseeable that the non-state actors could get hold of the uh, uh, arsenal or agents to develop 
their own uh, interventions. So it's applicable. I think uh, even uh, a blind scientist does not need to apply so many uh, 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 prototypes to understand or to see that this could be managed. But uh, maybe for some reasons, uh, political actors are more active than the scientists involved. So I think CBRN-related incidents could be curtailed if certain stringent methods, methods are applied. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suzuki. Yes. Uh, the cultural issue. I, I think this is uh, uh, part of Japanese culture uh, lacking security culture. It is true that the Japanese uh, people don't want to talk about bad things and don't uh, silence is golden kind of culture. So uh, even if you know something wrong with the system, they tend to keep si silent. That was the problem with the safety culture and security culture too. And so think unthinkable is, is, uh, is not part of the Japanese culture too. Uh, so that, that's, uh, we have to overcome. Uh, but is it, uh, just blaming the culture is not, it's not necessarily a good idea because it is true that some of the utility companies, some of the nuclear power plants survived listening to, the, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the local uh, knowledge and listening to uh, uh, the voice from other people. So there, there are ways to overcome, even under the Japanese culture. So I would say that uh, uh, security culture should be, should be a part of the... Uh, Behavior, even I mean, if 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 Japan really wants to to con continue to use this kind of uh, uh, technologies, I I don't think the, this is a black swan, but it's it is a, a series of the multiple events. I think the mafia law apply because uh, earthquake, tsunami, and power loss. It is a multiple uh, sources of the problem. And there were, the utilities were prepared against earthquake, they were prepared against tsunami, but they were also against the power loss, but they were not prepared for all three events at the same time. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, was a, this is really the mafia's role. And it is true, as you, you raised a question about methodologies, and, and it is true that uh, there are ways to get the sense of the precursors. To, and as I said, there were studies done by Japanese scientists and other people. So the question is, again, if you are a top management position and some of the junior scientists came up and said there may be a serious problem in the system, who is going to listen to the, the voice? And there should be a more open atmosphere for free discussion. That was lacking in, in Japanese culture. I mean, uh, <coughs> at least in TEPCO. That was a problem. And finally, the nuclear terrorism. Yes, uh, there were discussion, of course, uh, uh, done by uh, after, the, after this uh, uh, event, but also after 9-11, there are serious studies done by the nuclear terrorism. The most, my personal concern is the uh, the spent fuel pool uh, was one of the most vulnerable in the plant. It was not protected. It was, uh, well, well, yes, in the, in the pool. It's cooled down by uh, uh, the water. And the security measures uh, in, before, the, before this uh, Fukushima accident mainly targeted towards the, the most critically important facility in the nuclear power plant. But spent fuel, spent fuel pool is just, it's not uh, one of the most important facilities to be protected. And diesel power, the emergency diesel power generation also is not part of the uh, critical component of a nuclear reactor system. So now after this uh, Fukushima accident, any, you know, just normal facility could be a source of the serious nuclear accident. Even the beginning of the accident, well, actually, uh, the, the uh, power lines uh, tower was, fell because of the uh, earthquake. That 
that tower was not protected because it was not the part of the nuclear power plant, but it was important. Uh, so it was not uh, uh, the part of the security measures. So I think you're right that, that if you think about nuclear terrorism, they could attack many, many places, which could be a, could be a source of the serious accident eventually. So this is a serious issue. Uh, I think uh, uh, that should be a uh, 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 lesson learned from this uh, accident. How are you going to protect the many, many kinds of scenarios against terrorism? Dr. Barbeski, one minute, because I have eight people. Less than a minute. I have to elegantly disagree with my colleague on my left hand side in a radical way. We had do have alert system. We do know what's happened at the granularity every morning in everywhere in, in the world. Every, the point is how to translate those information into action. The international community cannot force feed somebody or a child. If we go to the country level and say, look, you have a problem and they don't do anything, or they are bureaucrats, less, less I wouldn't say the word corrupt, but less prone to, less incentive into a response, or uh, they lack the provision of adequate means for all good reason, then is not I, focusing on the alert only without the translation of this into actual effective response is uh, um, not uh, intellectually honest, I would say. All right. Could you uh, raise your hands, those who have for the floor? So I remember because I'm Alzheimer oriented. One, uh, that was two, three, and four. And then I take the second batch, which is the uh, remaining four uh, after that. Please, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tony Lippmann. I'm from Germany, a security consultant. So I'd like to uh, pick up where we just left and uh, add very briefly an aspect in that these discussions about lessons learned from Fukushima, Ebola, and Syria are not just, shouldn't just be about the lessons that we have learned, and by we I mean uh, governments, the industry, and the civil society, but also about what the bad guys might have learned uh, from these events. And you just mentioned that in the case of Fukushima, for instance, there were in the public fora lots of technical vulnerabilities discussed in great detail. You had uh, the, the effect in my own country, Germany, was that uh, uh, we, we, we made a decision to phase out of nuclear energy basically uh, in the course of an extended week weekend. And, and, and so this is something uh, you, you look at Ebola and the rather confused response in the United States and that after 14 years after anthrax and, and bioterrorism preparedness. So, so these events, not only the events, but also our responses to the events, make CBRN, I think, slightly more attractive every time this happens uh, for, for terrorist criminals than they were before. And we should be, uh, as a community, we should be aware of that. Excellent, thank you. Who's next? We Michel Richard, independent consultant and uh, research, uh, researcher associated to the FRS, especially to Dr. Suzuki. Uh, you have already started to answer the question. After Fukushima, and it's, uh, Fukushima is a safety issue, and it's prompted a lot of reflection on the link between security and, and safety. And um, the problem of uh, exposing the, um, the port in, 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 in safety uh, could, could be damageable to security and uh, it's, it's the problem of uh, the links between the technical security once is more open, safety, that's your third one, so and security is more confidential, it should be confidential. So I should be very happy to have your view on this question and what would be the development to in, the, in the future in, the, in this question? Okay. Yes, and I think for Ebola as well, we could have the question, to what extent this uh, Ebola crisis could have um, make uh, Liberia from fragile to failed? Uh, is there a link here between, uh, um, uh, because I was told that a lot of money had to be spent, <coughs> redirected towards this, at the detriment of 
uh, other critical things. Uh, okay, that's the that's link between security and, uh, and uh, safety. Um, Madam. Thank you very much. I think we can also question the way we run conferences, huh? Because should, that should be a re re repository. If you, and, uh, but maybe uh, we are only talking about ourselves. Sir. Uh, my name is Baki from the University of Zulu in South Africa. I, I just was to say uh, uh, about the issues that it's cost, uh, you know, the rest of the uh, One question that comes to mind is, when you put the response of Nigeria to the Obama incidents and the three countries of the 
beginning, Sierra Leone and Liberia, why was Nigeria's response so effective? You know, when, what do, and why is it different for those other sort of things? Okay. Uh, you finished? Yes. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, the floor is yours for five minutes. Then I, I want to run another batch of uh, questions, and we'll be done. Who wants to get, uh, <coughs> of course, uh, Professor Martin Scott Tabby? Yeah, um, the uh, Nigeria uh, took, had an added advantage to the system. Uh, Ebola came immediately after Nigeria had completed the Ebola value uh, 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 epidemic uh, system, and they had a ready system for that Ebola utilized. Uh, there was the global positioning uh, system used for contact tracing, and that system worked so well that uh, the contacts could be traced upon the first whistle blow of Patrick from Liberia to Nigeria, and every available contact was traced. So because of that effective system in place, there was preparedness, there was readiness, there was the necessary finance that was there, the expertise was there. So Nigeria came out of it without it uh, distributing to the uh, communicating into the larger public. So, so it's a matter of preparedness. So if Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, and Guinea had systems in place for one epidemic, uh, Ebola would have just built upon, I mean, built upon that and it would have been functional. So I think that is the answer. There's no miracle. Nobody should take the glory uh, that I did this, I did that, but the system. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Barbeski. Uh, I don't know which, which Nigeria outbreak. <laughs> which ne Nigeria outbreak did you see? Because it must have been another one. <laughs> Whenever I was four days after <laughs> it's been declared, and was nothing working. Literally. The poor victims, which were colleagues, were in a world which was a disgrace. However, they learned so quickly, they mobilized a million dollars to be spent overnight. I challenge each and every government here to make movable. The government was in Abuja, different party, different culture than Lagos. So whoever was on the response spared no effort in fixing. A, you can be prepared for a flu, but not for a board. So the preparedness was helpful up to a point. The capacity of being flexible in moving money, the capacity of uh, mobilizing the workers. They had a union meeting where, in a, in a room like this, where they were expressing fear, concern, money, how much you pay if I go inside. And uh, I took them on a bus and put them in a ward to have this conversation where their colleagues were actually in the ward. That evening, we got 60 volunteers. And that possibly was one of the way the things came out. The GPS was a smart move because we used the cell phones. Mm -hmm. However, without asking the local community leader to go and search for contact themselves, there are slums there where nobody is allowed, no doctor or no military is allowed to get inside. So it was truly a combination of that inventive creativity that everybody was on, on board. I, we could stop police car anywhere to go from the airport against the traffic. If you try that in Rome, it doesn't exist. So that, <laughs> really, they have to stop half the way to make gas, though, in an emergency. That, that preparedness could have been done better. Uh, Jenny, you had just said something perfect. Uh, was really one of the system. Now, how much is government can hold it without the mistrust of other government? The EU could be possibly a starting point of this repository. In the UN, there is an effort called CTITF, Counter Terrorist Task Force, which is now embedded in the Office of Political Affairs. We try to have the response of the various organizations. No one wants to be coordinated. That's another fundamental issue. But a repository of those lessons learned, and uh, uh, it's really, really, really one on the top that you should push your way up your chain of, of command. Of course, if you start from the victims, 
we are almost by default either informed or acting in most of the crises anyhow, because somebody gets hurt. That's what the, the terrorist wants. Uh, the rampant, the system in the IAEA in looking for emergencies is perfect. It's beautiful, it works, it's exercised every day, yes, and every day, no, but exists from 50 years. So it's something that is so long embedded into the culture of each of the organization. It's not a threat for coordination anymore. So it's, it's any, any beautiful system is, can be worked, but we have to give the organizations the time enough to develop those antibodies against the challenge of authorities or challenger. <laughs> why, why are they telling me what to do? Merci, Professor. Yes. Uh, uh, safety and security, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, uh, there are common area that uh, both experts should work together, and it is true that they do work together on some particular uh, area. But unfortunately, the culture is quite different. Safety people tend to think in uh, probability analysis. Security people don't think in the probability analysis. And so uh, also, as you, uh, somebody said, safety uh, information is now tend to be disclosed as much as possible. The security people tend to be secretive. So it, it is true that uh, uh, working together is, is not easy. And now, before, before Fukushima, actually, security and safety within Japanese government are different agency. Now it's under the same, same agency, so it, it is better. Uh, but it, under the same agency doesn't mean that they work together. So uh, it, it is a challenging task. And I'm concerned right now, for instance, cybersecurity people now questioning the safety of nuclear power plants. Yeah. The safety people say, no, no, cyber, we are, we are uh, perfectly okay for regarding the cyber attacks. That's, I don't know, which is true, but they have to work together. So it is, it is a challenging task uh, involving different cultural uh, people for the uh, protection of nuclear facilities. Uh, finally, the repository, uh, I, there is an uh, idea that we establish archives of the Fukushima accident. Again, there are different sources of anxiety. You know, if we, there are thousands of pages of testimony during the investigation, uh, but they spoke all these uh, experiences based on the assumption that it will not be disclosed because that people sometimes are offending some other people, many privacies, and also there are criminal investigation could be, could be, uh, you know, could happen. So uh, all the testimonies uh, are supposed to be, not be disclosed. But now, uh, under the public pressure, the government start to disclose some of those things and put into the one uh, national uh, parliamentary uh, library. Uh, so, but the huge data, and that should be a good reference for future. And unfortunately, we don't have any historic historians to analyze all these uh, uh, events, but we should have somebody to analyze what happened and unfortunately, there was no written records or recordings during the accident. That was the mistake. And so there are only uh, you know, hand, handwritten memos are available. So we should have, you know, keep the, all the records in one place so that we can learn lessons. Uh, another thing, one, one more thing. I think uh, one lesson I learned from this is that uh, the emergency management, crisis management is not just of course, it, as we discussed here, it can be common, uh, require common, common skills, common management uh, uh, challenges. So, so we should have, I think in Japan, we need some kind of central emergency management office, uh, which we don't have. And otherwise, you know, the lesson from, learned from sudden accident cannot be transferred to the nuclear accident. So we should have something like that. Okay, floor. Uh, you are the next one. Madam, uh, floor and you. Yes, please go ahead. Um, my name is Mian Her from University of Bradford, originally from South Korea. Uh, my question is directly to uh, Professor Suzuki. 
Um, I was literally shocked when the uh, Japanese government intended or attempted to uh, start um, the nuclear plants after Fukushima incident, you know, um, when the safety uh, issue was not, uh, had not yet resolved. So I must say um, the government actions uh, of Japanese, also my uh, government, you know, um, South Korean government is very disappointed, you know, by promoting nuclear uh, power as a very clean and safe nuclear energy. So, um, but I can understand uh, their rationale um, is uh, driven by the economic uh, profits. So, um, but I rather want to see the Japanese and also the uh, South Korean government um, promoting um, or um, become more proactive in changing um, energy sources rather than promoting those nuclear power or even enhancing the safe measure. So I wonder um, if any um, initiatives or action can be taken by, at least by Japanese academia, uh, to start initiatives of encouraging the government to think more innovatively or creatively than just, I mean, having the nuclear power plants in their land. Thank you. Um, let's go to here. Thank you. Yeah, Dari. Go back, trip over there. That would have been uh, difficulty because my first words were going to be about all hazards approach, and then I nearly had a hazard there. Uh, I'm very conscious we're running low on time. Sorry, Richard Guthrie, CBW events. Um, so there'd be sort of more bullet points than, than sort of coherent. Uh, the first one is all hazards approach is actually very important. You know, so many of the times um, you find there was an effective plan for some characteristic of this, but it was in the package somewhere else uh, that was being dealt with. The key a lot of the time here is always seems to be information. People don't recognize that a key element of an emergency is often you don't have enough information. Most, you know, if you know everything that's going on, something might be time urgent, but it's just a management problem. The difficulty is, is making judgment with a lack of information. And, and one of the problems is the tension between trying to make a judgment on what's the most likely outcome of what's happening and what is the worst case scenario? So certainly in the UK example, for example, um, for H1N1 came, that came out of Mexico, a lot of planning was on worst case scenario rather than what was actually the most likely output of the situation. It's very difficult when you don't have enough information. And we have to, I think, also create a more forgiving sort of culture where people have had to make judgments on inadequate information. And then, of course, with hindsight, you come up with a different conclusion. You have to say, well, yes, fine. You know, you move it. Now, the last thing is, is simply say, well, you mentioned World Food Programme. I would say one of the most interesting things that people forget is, is people who run music festivals, as somebody who works in music festivals, uh, because you set up a town in a greenfield site. Um, you move things around, try not to kill anybody, have to do it to time, because the show must go on. Actually, Jabor, just a bunch of roadies, is one of the most effective group of people to move things around for international development. Um, but one of the things I train uh, people within certain events is that everybody can declare something as unsafe. You have to be qualified to say something is safe, but most of the time when something has gone wrong, somebody has already noticed it, but they don't feel they're qualified to say, hang on a second, we need to look at this. Uh, and we really need to be create that culture where people can say, I'm not happy with what's in front of me, uh, and for people to then take that seriously. I'm Megan Palmer. I'm a senior research scholar at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you for having this session iterated by several other people. The opportunity to contrast and compare between vastly different scenarios in many ways is incredibly helpful, especially for somebody who is coming from one field. I'm in bio in particular. Um, but I often find that in these conversations, the the discussions of lessons learned only go to negative examples or negative learning examples. And so we probably don't have enough time today, but in the, in the context of maybe some of the other activities that might go on after this, whether it's a repository or others, 
I would love to see examples of sp specific things that went right. Things that went right and, and especially in an organizational context, what types of organizations um, have you experienced or, or, or been a part of that you think display some of the, um, the attributes to respond to, especially the communication challenges and others? There's been a few examples spoken about in terms of mobilization of finances and others, but are there, are there other examples that you, you might be able to bring up? Merci bien, Monsieur Dubré. Um, my name is Ali Rashid. I'm a policy advisor uh, in Interpol's counterterrorism branch, CDRNE. Um, I just, out of professional consciousness, I feel the need to highlight the importance of the law enforcement um, actor, whether it be a national or international domain. Um, in the three examples that we're addressing, uh, Interpol has been requested, actually, uh, quite explicitly by the countries involved and facing the crisis to provide any kind of support to the law enforcement community on the ground, uh, even if we're addressing some incidents or uh, crises that weren't at least explicitly proven to be uh, deliberately done. Uh, Ebola, for example, um, uh, the law enforcement community in all affected countries were completely overwhelmed um, by the deterioration, very rapid deterioration of the security um, situation in all affected countries. Um, whether it be in intercepting the illegal uh, movement of the affected people across border, and that obviously falls directly under the mandate of Interpol in terms of communication and, um, uh, and, and coordination among countries, but also uh, clear threats that the staff of international organizations, NGOs, medical teams were facing um, on the ground while they were trying to actually help uh, the situation. There was also some evidence of, of um, blood samples being uh, attacked and taken while being transported between laboratories. All of these things fall directly into the hands of the law enforcement field. But obviously, when we think of the Ebola crisis, the first thing we think of is the public health, logically, dimension. But there is also a, a, a grave um, law enforcement side. Uh, we got a lot of lessons learned from that, and we've been in, in, in direct communication, more substantive cooperation with, uh, whether it be with law when public health um, actors on the ground or on the international level on behalf of WHO. Uh, in the chemical situation, I think one of the major uh, lessons learned um, was, again, uh, operating in a very deteriorated security environment, sending experts with technical scientific background, not necessarily having the security element being covered properly, which led to a much greater involvement of Interpol within mechanisms such as the Secretary General Mechanism of Investigation, for example. And we're now currently partnering uh, personally on a daily basis with UNODA and being part of other mechanisms on the ground. Um, from a security aspect, it's a bit, I think, challenging to share um, quite openly uh, it's true, lesson learned, because yes, terrorists and criminals are watching and they are learning pretty fast. Um, it's amazing to see how they even do open media scanning like we do, <laughs> and, they, uh, and they put it into their own uh, propaganda documents and, 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 and self-education and radicalization publications. Uh, a simple example, which was the boom of the use of Abrant, for example, a couple of years ago, there were several cases um, monitored and, 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 and published and uh, mediatized um, around the world. And only a couple of months later, Abram was automatically added into the documentations, terrorist documentations like Inspire, for example, and magazines such as, uh, as those. So we need to be quite careful in, in sharing the best practices from a security dimension, but at the same time balancing it um, with keeping it within the trusted community, obviously, otherwise we lose track of the information. Thank you. All right. One minute max for you to continue your three to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, uh, the uh, question of energy policy. Uh, I think uh, restarting nuclear power plants, uh, um, it's a difficult question for local community. They local community depends on the nuclear power. And uh, um, I, I think it has to be judged based on each, each nuclear power plant case rather than generic because uh, 
It is true that the technical safety standards have been improved quite significantly, so the existing power plants are quite safe. But it's the evacuation plan that's what I'm concerned. The evacuation plan has to be very local specific. So it has to be approved by the local public. It's very difficult to, to judge how you're gonna, how you're gonna judge with, uh, local the evacuation plan is safe or not. But in terms of energy policy, the decreasing dependence on nuclear power is also a part of energy policy in Japan. So that should be the case. Um, the final positive uh, experiences, I think two. One is, the, as I said, Tohoku nuclear power plants, Tohoku electric power companies, uh, listen to the local uh, experts on tsunami. So they put the nuclear power plants much higher place, which the Fukushima didn't, uh, TEPCO didn't listen to. And interesting is the head of the nuclear engineering department and Tohoku Electric Power is always non-technical expert. And that is very unique. So they, they, uh, they have to be convinced by the technical people in managing safety. Second is the uh, emergency case uh, in the new, during the Fukushima accident. <coughs> The, the information, the real-time information was not shared between headquarter and uh, emergency headquarter and TEPCO. But uh, they found out that TEPCO headquarter shared the real-time information with the Fukushima site. So the Prime Minister Khan, which was blamed for many things, but he did one good thing. He brought the emergency headquarter to TEPCO headquarter. After that, the sharing information did work very well. So uh, I think the sharing the information in the real-time basis is very, very critically important, which uh, thanks to Prime Minister Khan's decision to do that, it, was, it worked very well. Okay. Professor Barbaris. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'll begin with um, the the challenge in shifting resources which are not even available to cope with uh, a CBRN emergency, especially a one with multi, multi complex layer like the Ebola, which created a fear even in the United States. <clears throat> so uh, the post Ebola recovery plan is a very welcome strategy for uh, countries who have not, who are facing uh, emergencies or have not got such a plan in place. Uh, secondly, the good thing among the lessons learned was cultural sensitivity. When the international community understood that you cannot go and impose rules and uh, regulations into the values of others, uh, things began going well. In the areas where culture was highly uh, held to uh, its maximum, uh, cultural practices, uh, when the corporation, when the language changed, they also changed their behavior. So we saw that a lot of improvement happened because of communication. The communication strategy changed and the communications were now disseminated by the trusted individuals within the community that changed a lot of behavior during uh, the Ebola outbreak. Uh, awareness raising too was done through community-based organization that contributed a lot in uh, the paradigm shift in the, uh, in the, uh, during the outbreak. And uh, personal hygiene, is one of the things today that everyone becomes uh, his brother's keeper, washing hand washing before entering public buildings and, and that so on. So we think that there were so many positive lessons learned too, as well as um, the negatives. But usually, uh, wherever there is news, there must be bad news. So uh, I will stop at that note and thank you for the situation. Security, Interpol, in any crisis which more than two people or any traffic accident, they have to be involved anyhow. So they have to be integrated. There is cultural thing. We work it out. There is no solution to any big crisis without the working together with the, well, the both keepers of the community, any community. There is a soldier, there is a priest, and there is a doctor. 
Um, in this whole hazard approach and this uh, center of command and control, they are often good, up to very good, when the problem doesn't move. If you have a large Fukushima thing, or so you have a large Bhopal, it can be large in area, but doesn't move. Germs, viruses, mm. just go across borders. Mm. So your collaboration, your center, which is in the nation E, may become irrelevant to coordinate on nation Y or state Z. So I always have, this system are beautiful, they work well up to very well, rampant, exactly. But when a problem moves, then you go back into uh, authority, this is my country, that's your country, closing border, who's in charge, who's coordinated. And the last on a positive note, I found that events with 12,000 victims, like Ebola, let alone the people disrupted, or 1,500 plus in Syria, uh, especially if you look at them in the eyes, it doesn't look well in a positive things, but it does offer us the chance to do it again. That's why we are all in is this room, most of us. Thank you.